It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Ariana Huffington, journalist extraordinaire, founder of HuffPost. I sort of start and end my day on HuffPost sometimes, I feel. Author of 15 best-selling books, including most recently, The Sleep Revolution. Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential, Forbes' Most Powerful Women, board member to Uber, Onyx, Global Citizen, Just Capital. Feels super hard driving. And feels like, oh my god, how do you manage all of this in 24 hours? And yet, we find ourselves here talking about her latest venture, which she founded in 2016, called Thrive Global, a corporate, a corporate and consumer well-being and productivity platform to help us change the way we work and live. Welcome, Ariana. What Thank happened you to so that? much. Where does that hard charging, Forbes most powerful, Times 100 most influential, get to talking about sleep? Well, um, this is a fantastic question to start with because it's at the heart of everything we're doing at Thrive, which is ending the delusion that we've been living under really since the first industrial revolution, so for decades, that in order to succeed, in order to achieve amazing things like everybody here is doing, we need to be always on. We need to never stop to unplug and recharge. And what is interesting about that is that we now have overwhelming data, scientific findings that prove that the opposite is true. That in fact, when we take time to recharge, we operate from a deeper, uh, more productive, more effective, more creative part of ourselves, and we achieve much more in a more sustainable way. And what is interesting, you know, you and I come from ancient civilizations. India and ancient Greece, you know, knew that. So if you go back to the ancient wisdom of our cultures, they knew that, you know. I mean, I, as you know, I, 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 India is my favorite country. I studied at Shantaniketan University when I was 17, and the Bhagavad Gita makes it very clear that there is that higher life where you actually operate from resources that otherwise you don't even know you have. But somewhere, despite of being in Shantaniketan when you were 17, I think I heard something about hitting a head on exactly. a desk that caused this awakening. Absolutely. I kind of basically bought into the collective delusion, which is really hard to avoid if you're a type A personality like everybody here is, I'm sure, and everybody on stage, let's admit it. So um, I absolutely bought into all that. And so two years into building the Huffington Post, being a divorced mother of two teenage daughters, which is, has its own problems attached, I collapsed uh, from burnout, sleep deprivation, exhaustion, hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone. And that was really the beginning of my new awakening that led to uh, launching Thrive and being here. How long did it take from that awakening to really, you know, change habits and be that person who's now, you know, has best-selling books on this topic? So, you know, I'm a kind of uh, research freak. So I started studying everything, delving into the latest science, and the entire Thrive Global platform is based on the scientific knowledge that we grow and change through micro steps. It doesn't happen overnight. It's small, incremental, daily changes. So um, that's what happened with me uh, in every aspect of life, from uh, the obvious, you know, sleep, um, meditation, um, but also what's happening in our minds, because very often it's this, what I call the obnoxious roommate living in our head, you know, that negative voice. We women have it worse, guys, you know, <laughs> self-doubt and um, questioning everything that we need, to, we need to address. So doing all that 
eliminates a lot of the energy leaks, so makes more energy available to us to simply get things done and achieve groundbreaking things. Okay, so here you are with your awakening and your research and you're armed with it. But you're starting a company like a lot of folks here, small companies which have fast growth. Did it worry you that maybe this is not good for business? This is you know, good for the person that your company may need to be hard charging? How do the business leaders in this room make a change within their organizations? So being hard charging is absolutely the necessary way to get anything done. Uh, Yarli Paul, who is here, who heads product for Thrive Global, and I call it having a high metabolism. We don't want to hire anybody who does not have a high metabolism. We don't <laughs> want to hire anybody who is not hard charging. And at the beginning, there were some people who thought, oh, this company is about thriving. I can join and chill under a mango tree. No, no. We, <laughs> wrong company. No, we just believe, and we have the data to prove it. When I say believe, it's not really the right word. That when hard charging individuals then take some time to unplug and recharge, they are going to be much more effective when they return hard charging. And that's really the key. And you know that because, every, I mean, I'm so happy to be speaking to an audience which is so much about getting things done, achieving, and knowing that you need a focus to be able to do that. And I think what is key here is also our relationship with technology because we are all a little addicted. I see a few people who can't stop looking at their phones. Let me just tell you something, that's perfectly fine, but don't fool yourself into thinking you're, we are also listening to us. You are <laughs> making a choice that clearing emails or texts right now is more important. I totally get it, we're not offended. <laughs> I just want to make it clear that multitasking is a myth. You cannot do two things at once that involve mental energy. Yeah, you can wash the dishes and listen to a podcast, but you can't do two things that require cognitive energy. That's why at Thrive Global, we don't allow devices during meetings. Because you know these incredibly long and unproductive meetings when everybody, the minute there is a moment of boredom, goes to their phone. You know, they pretend that they are taking notes, but you know they're not. <laughs> so we basically say, listen, if you have something more important to do, go do it. If you're here, just be 100% present. And so there's an enormous amount of stuff that we can bring to our companies to be able to be hard charging in a sustainable way. Building a company is not a sprint, it's a marathon. So we need to do it for the long haul. Um, you have termed this two kind of very interesting terms. You described 2017 as the year of the Great Awakening, where we became aware of what technology is doing to us, and 2018 as the Great Reckoning. What's happening? How did we get here? <laughs> well, as you know, everybody here is involved in building great products or running great companies. So, you know, f until 2017, in uh, speaking generally, we were completely enthralled with technology. We did not really look at the unintended consequences. There was a certain kind of triumphalism around tech. 2017 was the year of great awakening when we also saw that even though there's so much to celebrate around the role of tech in our lives, there are also unintended consequences. And they have to do largely with the way technology is infringing on our humanity. So we need to establish rules of the road. We need to establish sacred boundaries. And uh, I love the Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, the great Buddhist monk line, that it has never been easier to run away from ourselves. That's kind of a really interesting thing to talk about because uh, this morning, I talked about what we are doing in digital <coughs> well-being, right? Uh, most of the platforms <coughs> have announced some investments where they're giving users more control over their tech, and we're expecting users to choose uh, what they can and how much they use. Are we doing enough? 
Well, first of all, I think the launch of digital well-being was fantastic. You know, I was there applauding. I loved seeing your CEO in front of a screen that said JOMO, the joy of missing out. I think it was one of those great moments in tech when a great tech leader acknowledges the responsibility of tech to actually produce um, products that help people manage their relationship with technology in a way that improves the quality of their lives. And what I love about that is that it, it is clearly good for business also. Because in the end, if, if your consumers recognize that you are adding value to their lives, their loyalty will only increase. Um, I think this is an ongoing pursuit. I don't think there will ever be a day when we can say we've done enough, we are done. I think as uh, Apple showed, you know, bringing uh, screen time on iOS, which helps you manage your relationship with technology, more and more tech companies now are entering the field. Um, Thrive launched um, an app for Android, so anybody here on Android can uh, <laughs> download it. <laughs> uh, it's called the Thrive app, and uh, it, you, it can help you put your phone in Thrive mode. Let's say you're having dinner with your children or your girlfriend or your boyfriend and you don't want to be distracted. Uh, if I text you, I'll get a text back. You are in Thrive mode until such and such a time, which I love because it also changes the cultural norm. Right now, we sort of congratulate people for being always on, for answering texts immediately. We need to change that. We need people to say, hey, you know, Ariana has a real sense of priority. She really takes some time to be undistracted when she's doing something that matters. And the other thing the app does, it gives you a dashboard every day of your social media, game, and general app consumption. And it can help you set limits if you so decide. Let's say the app shows that you spend two hours on um, Instagram and it asks you if you want to limit it. If you say, yes, I want to spend an hour and a half, it will give you notifications, and at an hour and a half, it cuts you out. Tough love. So uh, Apple has put it on the operating system um, for um, iOS users, which is great. I, they don't have the Thrive mode, but they have everything else. So again, I think tech for good tech that helps us improve the quality of our lives is just a great opportunity for any developers in the room to pursue in the future. And yet, I'm sure everybody sitting here are measuring, what's my engagement metric? How many minutes is somebody spending in my app? Uh, feels a little scary that people are going to get out of their app. How should we measure? Like these folks in this room, how should they measure uh, what's success? Um, absolutely, we're all going to be measure, measuring uh, consumer engagement. At Thrive, obviously, we measure consumer engagement on our media platform, on our different social platforms. The question is, what are they doing while they're engaging with you? Is what they're doing while they're engaging with you improving their life or diminishing their life? And also, are you becoming so addictive that other parts of their lives are suffering? You know, their relationships with their loved ones, their relationship with themselves. These are the questions to ask. And the one thing I can guarantee is that these things are not in opposition to your business metrics. Because in the end, I'm convinced that the people who will win the future are the people who add value to consumers' lives. Often ahead of what consumers think they need. One of my favorite marketing stories is Henry Ford, you know, when they, um, who said that if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. Instead, I gave them a car. So we, we all sometimes give consumers something they may not even fully know they want. But if it improves their lives, that's an incredible source of loyalty. That leads us really well into something you and I just caught up a couple minutes ago. And you said, how about teaching empathy and other things through apps and games? 
And you have talked a lot about human-centered design. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, uh, we are all fascinated with AI and the growth of AI. And Kai Fu Lee recently wrote a very interesting book predicting that two thirds of jobs are going to be eliminated by AI, but the jobs that are going to be at a premium are jobs that um, require purely human qualities, like creativity, empathy, compassion, love. These are the, the qualities that we humans are unbeaten at. So in the war for talent, these are the qualities that are going to be at a premium. So how do we cultivate them? So my kind of plea with anybody here who is a developer is to, to build products that cultivate human empathy. And I think this is going to be an incredible business opportunity because Empathy is going to be a greater and greater requirement for any interactions. In companies, in order to build successful teams, you need, you need um, human beings who know how to empathize with each other. Um, so if you can create games that can teach empathy, whether it's to kindergartners or to um, people at any age, it would be an incredible benefit. And if anybody has any such idea, please let me know, because we would love to help support it, help fund it, help uh, amplify it. Basically, we are in the business, not just of building our own company, but helping that whole ecosystem that produces tech for good, that improves the quality of our lives. And Taking that one step further, one way I suppose to be empathetic is to respect your user's time. And you've also talked about building more respectful experiences. How do you know you're respecting your user's time? The question is, is your user using your app uh, or your game or whatever intentionally? Or are they just using it in a compulsive way? Um, without getting any benefit at the end of it. You know that when you have that feeling of, oh my God, I can't believe I spent <laughs> 40 minutes on Candy Crush. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, 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 you, and you have that kind of sinking feeling. Uh, well, that's not something you want associated with your program long term. You know, short term, you may get a benefit from it. But I think, you know, we may not have superhero mo movies for coders and developers, but I think maybe we should make some superhero movies for coders and developers who are actually producing products that are helping people invest their time well, because that's all we have. You know, I've always been fascinated by philosophy and the meaning of life, you know, ever since I was a little girl. And, and in the end, you know, how we spend our time is how we spend our life. Uh, it's the cumulative uh, result of all these daily decisions we make. I love that. How we spend our time is how we spend our life. So maybe we, you know, we started with your great awakening by literally hitting your head on a table. And we went into trying to figure out what everybody can do from a business responsibility perspective. I want to bring it back to you. This has been an amazing journey in both, first of all, thank you for applying your incredible journalistic mindset <laughs> to this problem. It's been an incredible journey in, in learning this. What were the surprises for you individually in getting to this place? Were there drawers <laughs> that did you slip off <laughs> the bandwagon, as they say? And did you have to climb back in? Well, I. I feel so passionate about this topic that you know, I left the Huffington Post two years ago to launch Thrive, and frankly, I never ever thought I would do that because HuffPost was like a third child, you know, two daughters and HuffPost. But I wanted to, to go beyond just writing and speaking about these topics and actually do something that helps people go from perhaps knowing what they want to do to actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And what brought me to journalism at the beginning was that 
desire we all have to reduce human suffering. And there is a lot of human suffering in the world that we, we cannot really easily reduce. You know, when you um, read the stories of refugee children or children separated from their parents or um, violence everywhere. But this is an incredible cause of human suffering that we can change simply by changing beliefs. Because once we eliminate the belief, which is unbelievably prevalent, that all successful people do it by being always on and sacrificing everything else to that cause, once we eliminate that delusion, we are going to be eliminating an incredible cause of disease, of bad decisions, and unnecessary mental health problems. Mm -hmm. So that's an incredible cause, and that's really the very ambitious cause of Thrive. And we do it through our work with corporations, and we do it through the media platform. But what we have found is that the most effective thing on the media platform is not the data we collect. We collect all the latest science on these topics. But what moves hearts and minds is the stories of very successful people in the arena who are living their lives differently as a result of their own wake-up calls or epiphanies, all very different, but having a similar point to my own epiphany. And actually, one of your colleagues, Philip Schindler, the chief business officer at Google, had his own moment of epiphany that he wrote about on Thrive, which I love, which was that he came from a trip, and he has young children, and he told his children, Daddy is taking you to the playground. And his five-year-old said to him, Oh, no, can't the babysitter take us? And he asked why. And his son said, Because when you're in the playground, you're always on your phone. So that was his moment of epiphany, when he decided, I'm busy, I travel a lot. When I'm going to be with my children, I'm going to be with my children and I'm not going to be on my phone. And then after he wrote about it, he told me what an impact it had in his own org. And I know it had an incredible impact among people who simply admire him. People need permission to make these little changes because there is a fear that if I get my foot off the gas for even five minutes, I'm not going to be able to succeed. It's a very deep-seated fear. And so when we collect the stories of very successful people, Jeff Bezos wrote on Thrive that he sleeps for eight hours a night because he says it improves his decision making. And he analyzed his decision making and he wrote that when he sleeps for less, his decision making is five to 20% less good. <laughs> and the piece went crazy viral. And so we bring in people in the arena and have them write about what makes them most effective. It's really, I like to out very successful people and the <laughs> good things they do, because we've heard so much about very successful people bragging. You know, like, I mean, okay, the, the other extreme, which is a teachable moment, is Elon Musk. You know, he's totally captive of this delusionary belief that he has to do everything himself. He has to sleep under his desk. He cannot see his children. But we see the result of that. We see that he tweets in the middle of the night that he got the funding to take Tesla private, which was not true, which led to an SEC investigation, which led to him having to step down as chairman, being fined $20 million. Not a very good decision. You know, we have him on, um, I'm, I'm saying that I love Elon Musk, I think he's brilliant and a great visionary, but he's also doing an incredible service now by demonstrating the delusion of the way he's working. <laughs> and that may be just an incredible gift to humanity. <laughs> I wrote an open letter to him saying all that out, saying, you know, the way you are working is unscientific. <laughs> you know, you claim to really have developed and you have a new way to manage energy to, for cars, what about managing energy for humanity? And that's why this is such an exciting time. 
Well, no wonder you're so quotable. Managing energies for cars versus <laughs> managing energies for humanity. Um, the meme in the valley, which you are well aware, is that sleep is for the weak. Yes. And you have picked that as your cornerstone of well-being. Can you talk about why sleep? Yeah, we actually have eight pathways um, broken down into micro steps, and sleep is one. The reason why there's so much focus on sleep is because for so many decades, it's been so dismissed and held in contempt. And yet, all the science makes it very clear that it's a foundation of health, not just of our physical health, but our brain health. And um, we now know, and a lot of that research was done nearby here at Stanford, where the first scientific sleep center was founded only in 1970. So it's a relatively young science. But we now see that the way our culture has, has been contemptuous of sleep has actually led to tremendous problems and, and bad decisions and health outcomes, including heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's. Because the bottom line is that unless you have a genetic mutation, and one to one and a half percent of the population does, and you don't need a lot of sleep. I'm sure there are people here who don't, and that's great. And you know it, you can also be tested. But I know that if I have three or four hours sleep, it's not enough. So the majority of us need seven to nine hours. I'm an eight hour girl. And when I get my eight hours, it's like bring it on. Whatever the challenge, <laughs> whatever I can handle it. And also, I'm not robbed of the joy of life. One of the things that I know, when I'm sleep deprived, I can still be transactional. We can still go through the motions of our day, but something is missing. And I don't want that spark to miss, because as far as we know, that's our only life, although reincarnation is a very good possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't want to just get things done. I want to experience the joy and the gratitude of the fact that I'm doing something I love and I believe in and how, what a blessing that is. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, given that this is where you find yourself, what's next for you? So, what's next? As you know, Thrive Global is the name of the company, not just because we could get the URL, uh, this is, <laughs> you know, this is a global crisis and the solution is global. So we launched, our first international launch was in India. Uh, we launched in partnership with the Times of India and uh, I love what we are doing there in the middle of what is a mental health crisis, especially among millennials who are particularly addicted to their phones. Uh, we launched in my homeland in Greece and we, are, we launched in Australia, we are going to China, and we are launching around the world. And in every big culture, we are customizing what we are offering with the culture of the country, because there's such amazing wisdom in India, in China, in Japan, and I think it's so important to bring everything we're doing and integrate it with the culture and the wisdom of the region. And, uh, and for me, I, I'm, I'm just so incredibly grateful when people write and tell their stories. So I want to invite you to tell your stories because that's how we learn from each other. Um, whether it's stories of um, wake-up calls like mine or Philip Schindler's or whether they are stories of your own life hacks and what you do to be most effective, please share them with the world. It's just an incredible service. And also, I, I hardly would um, not forgive me if I didn't say that we are hiring. <laughs> 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 we have opened an office in, um, in San Francisco. Our, our headquarters is in New York, and we, are, we really want to grow our product and engineering team very fast because we have so many projects in line. And I'm also, for the women in the room, I'm also thrilled to say that we have a head of product with a woman in Yardley and a CTO in Cheryl Paul, who is also a woman who just joined us from Salesforce. So I'm also, I'm very happy to recruit men. Let me make <laughs> that very clear. 
Um, but I also think it's an amazing time to be a woman in product and engineering. Look at you. <laughs> and uh, and it's, um, it's, it's great to be building a team that we hope is going to add a lot of value to people's lives. Well, you have some super creative people. I know you're trying to recruit them. But besides <laughs> recruiting them, if there's one message you want to leave them with, what would that be? So my message is that you are the architects of the future. And uh, what you choose to do and where you choose to put your own creativity and um, your own imagination um, is going to change the world. So it, it's really incredibly important. Um, whether you're running businesses or developing or coding or anything at all, this is a pivotal moment. The decisions we make every day, the products we build, the businesses we build, are going to affect dramatically uh, the way we live and the world we create. And I'm not at all worried about AI, because um, AI may become more intelligent than we are, but it will never become more loving more compassionate, more empathetic, or, my cre or more creative. That's our competitive edge. Let's cultivate it. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. I hope every one of us will take this, at least for me, uh, I think that I will remember, am I transacting or am I actually feeling the joy of what I'm doing mm. with gratitude. And can you please write about it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> she said that in front of many witnesses. <laughs> so we're going to hold it accountable. And what was it like having here on stage for 30 minutes two women with accents? <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, give Ariana a very, very big hand.